Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Caitlin Majika, and I'm with the National Center on Intensive Intervention at the American Institutes for Research. I'd like to start by letting you know if you'd prefer to have captions available during this webinar, to please follow the link that Eliza will be providing in the chat, and you can have access to captions there. The National Center on Intensive Intervention and the Center on Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports has partnered together to create a webinar series focused on supporting secondary students with intensive needs during the pandemic. And our focus is on supporting these students during virtual learning and in the return to in-person learning. The intended audience is state and local leaders who support stu secondary students with intensive needs. For a little bit more information about our webinar series, our first webinar, webinar focused on Check and Connect, Implementation and Adaptation in a Virtual Environment. The recording and slides from this webinar are available on our webpage, and Eliza's going to put a link to that in the chat box for your access. Today, we're going to focus on early warning systems, and at the end of April, our webinar series will conclude with a webinar focused on intensive intervention, supporting secondary students with intensive behavior needs. This will occur on April 30th, and Eliza will put the link to the regist for registration for that webinar in the chat as well. Today, as I mentioned, we are going to focus on early warning systems with the goal of helping you think about how you can use data to plan for the 2021-2022 school year. We will start by setting the stage for fall of 2021. Then we will hear from four districts who will provide an overview of early warning system use in their schools and districts. At the end, we will conclude with a panel discussion where our members from our four districts will answer questions. Um, and this will allow you as an audience time to ask your questions as well. And then we will have a wrap up and closing. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please put them in the question box and we will try our best to answer them during the panel discussion. So I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague who is going to talk about setting the stage for fall of 2021. Hi everyone, this is Jenny Scala. I'm a principal researcher at American Institutes for Research. Um, can we get the slides back? I just lost the slides. Um, and I've been doing early warning system work here at AIR for over 10 years. Um, and we are really, really happy to have our session today. Um, before we get into it though, um, as Caitlin said, I want to set the stage a little bit. So our session today is not necessarily, not necessarily, it is not designed to be a primer or an explan explan explanation of what early warning systems are or implementation processes for early warning systems. We do have a few slides at the end of the deck that have links to more resources if that's what you're looking for. And you can always feel free to reach out to me if you'd like more information. Why we wanted to do this session today in this time period is that we know that school leaders and districts um, and states are starting to plan for the fall. And we know that planning for this fall is unlike any other fall. Um, there've been a lot of resources, articles, talking about learning loss, talking about low attendance, talking about how to really support students when they come back to, when, when fall starts again. Um, and we're, we know that early warning systems can be and might be used as part of the solution in many schools and districts across the country. With that being said though, we want to um, not assume that the systems that were in place prior to the pandemic will still work as is. And so we wanted to pose questions for contemplation about how to potentially think about using and leveraging your current early warning system work to support fall 2021 efforts of supporting students. We recognize that no one has all the answers or even the answers, um, but we collectively can learn from each other. And what we wanted to do today was to provide a forum to really think through some of those possibilities of what people and districts are thinking about. And to that end, we're really fortunate that we'll be hearing from four districts along with someone from a state education agency that are in various stages of using early warning systems uh, and to hear how and what they're contemplating when they think about um, fall 2021. With that, on the next slide, we have some assumptions that we made in talking with our districts and planning for this session. So we wanted to first, as you think about enrollment, we know that there are students who did not engage with school last year or this year. 
um, and that those students may return next year. So we want to plan for that. Uh, we also want to think about and make maybe make some assumptions about levels of risk. So maybe thinking about whether or not all students will be coming back to school with some level of risk rather than a binary you are displaying symptoms of risk or you're not a student, maybe some sort of scaffolded approach of a, a green, yellow, red aspect of risk. Um, and it could be that that risk is on things beyond just what we've traditionally used in early warning systems of attendance, course performance, and behavior. In terms of interventions, we do, we've heard, we know people are thinking about having a more robust catalog of available interventions thinking about how to have tier one supports around social emotional learning, but then also having tier two and tier three supports that might be focused more on mental health. And on those tier one supports, we know in a tiered framework approach that our goal is to best serve the majority of students with that strong tier one supports. Um, and so given the context that we're in and maybe some risk level assumptions that we might need different tier one supports, um, maybe thinking about setting and being explicit about school-wide behavioral expectations, maybe thinking about doing summer bridge programs for more students because students might need that um, time period to, to be explicitly taught how to be a student in school again. So these are some of the assumptions that we wanted to make and be clear about as we're having our conversation today. The next slide um, is, um, a list of our um, our participants and presenter panelists. That's the word I'm looking for, panelists that are going to be joining me today. I first want to introduce Amy Szymanski, and then she's going to introduce everybody else. Um, Amy Szymanski is a statewide secondary transitions and workforce development consultant at the State Support Team Region 1 in Toledo, Ohio, where she works directly for the office, Ohio Department of Education's Office for Exceptional Children. And her work focuses on graduation, dropout, Transition Planning for Students with Disabilities, ages 14 through 22. Amy, thanks so much for joining us, and please introduce our other panelists. Great, thank you so much, Jenny. I am thrilled to be here, and even more thrilled to introduce our team. Um, I will start um, by introducing Bob Longworth, who is the superintendent of Lachlan Local Schools. Lachlan Local is a very small urban school district in Lachlan, Ohio, which is located between Dayton and Cincinnati. Uh, the Lachlan team was a member of our Ohio Department of Education's on-time graduation project during the 1819 and 1920 school years. Excellent team members, and we are just so thrilled that they are um, here today to talk to us about the work that they've done and continue to do. Dr. Mona Burt Speedy is a consultant for the State Support Team Region 13, and she has supported um, Lachlan throughout this process. Um, the region, uh, State Support Team Region 13 also um, provides support to other school districts throughout the greater Cincinnati area as well. Um, then I also have Tim Seiss, uh, who is the principal at North College Hill School District, also in Cincinnati. Uh, Tim learned about the great work that was taking place during the on-time graduation project through another of uh, Dr. Um, Bert Speedy's contacts and uh, colleagues at the State Support Team Region 13, who then reached out to me and wanted to learn more information about early warning systems and is, is going to share you know, some of the great things they're doing um, at his school. Then I also have uh, Jennifer Lawless, who is the College and Career Readiness Executive Director at Toledo Public Schools. And geez, uh, <laughs> Jen has been working with me for, in some capacity, for probably, I think, 10 years now. Um, Toledo Public Schools is one of the early adopters of an early warning system in Ohio, and they continue to implement to this day. So thank you so much for joining us. And then last but definitely not least is Pete Dunn, who is a federal programs director for Western Local Schools in Latham, Ohio, another small district, which is in the south central portion of Ohio. And Pete has been the fearless and tireless leader of Western's team um, in the on-time graduation project, while uh, Laughlin was also um, a member of the project. So just a, a great group with some incredible knowledge and experience, and I'm just excited that they'll have a chance to share with you. So I am going to pass that back over to Caitlin. 
Thank you, Amy. We're excited to have you and your colleagues from the state of Ohio here with us today to share a little bit more about what's happening in their districts and how they're thinking about early warning systems and data going into this future school year. I would first like to bring our team from the Lachland Local School District first, and they will be up to share a little bit more information with you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And thank you for that introduction, Amy. I appreciate that. So as Amy explained, uh, we became a part of the early warning systems work as a part of the on-time graduation pilot in partnership with the Ohio Department of Education a couple of years ago. And that partnership and those efforts have proven to be beneficial this year as we navigate um, our uncharted waters as we uh, work through this first year under pandemic conditions. So um, a, a lot of the experiences that that we learned a lot about during those first two years really did serve us and serve our teams well here within the school district. I, I would say that the first um, the first major benefit that that we experienced was this was an opportunity for us to really uh, coordinate and align all of our efforts as they uh, pertain to improvement, whether that was around attendance, student engagement, academic performance, and also student behaviors and just creating a, a, an environment that's really conducive to teaching and learning. Um, that coordination uh, brought together a lot of our plans that made a lot of sense to people that were a part of those plans, but they, they kind of operated in isolation and in silos. So we started this work with really looking at uh, what do our multi-tiered systems of supports really look like for all kids in our school district, uh, grades K through 12, as it relates to attendance and engagement, academic performance, and also behavioral expectations? And by, by looking at it from that perspective, it, it really helped us with our um, Ohio improvement process frameworks, where teams of teachers, where building leadership teams, and also our district leadership team began to really focus in on um, things that were gonna help us make decisions based on concrete data to support all kids, and then ultimately smaller groups of students and individual students when our data um, indicated a need to do that. So for us, having an early warning system in place, um, attendance and engagement were a huge concern for every school district that I've engaged with this year. Uh, between remote learning, on-site learning, hybrid models, uh, some schools and districts that were forced to go in and out of those three options based on uh, virus numbers in the community made it even more important for us to keep track of uh, the levels of attendance and engagement for our students. And the early warning systems approach that we've embraced here builds in 30-day attendance checks for every student within our school district. And these are um, analyzed and evaluated by teacher-based teams who can actually put names and faces to the data points up to building level teams so that we can analyze trends and patterns by grade level. And then also our district leadership team so that we can begin having conversations about what are the implications for our need in the areas of maybe it's human capital, uh, perhaps professional learning opportunities or more concrete resources that we need to bring into the mix here in our district to better support staff and also students and families. Additionally, um, academic achievement uh, was a paramount concern for every district that I've talked about this year. It's, it's really scary when you get away from the norm uh, of coming in every day, Monday through Friday. And uh, our district was lucky in that we've been able to keep our doors open for full days, five days a week throughout the duration of the school year. But um, we have 35% of our students and families that are still opting for a remote learning opportunity. And they're facilitating through learning partnerships with us in the home, what that instruction looks like even today with the pandemic numbers decreasing. So it's really opened up our eyes to the fact that um, families and students were clamoring for some options that public school districts just quite frankly weren't equipped or ready to deliver. And now uh, we see that, that that's going to be very, very important moving forward as a district and also as a state and ultimately as a nation. So we've built in quarterly checks as a part of our early warning systems um, as they relate to academic achievement. And for us, it's very simple, very rudimentary. We look at a, a grade distribution analysis beginning at grade three. 
and literally analyze the number and percentage of kids that are earning A's and B's in courses, those that are earning C's and D's in courses, and uh, the percentage of population that may not be passing their courses and earning F's at the end of the quarter. So that there are never any surprises and teacher-based teams are looking at this bi-weekly uh, through meetings that we are facilitating with administrators and also some academic and data coaches and through our state system support team member, Dr. Bert Speedy, who's on our call today. So it's really brought a level of awareness to what's going on as it relates to um, student success and growth and performance in those two areas. Uh, lastly, behavior and our positive behavior intervention support structures have also really benefited greatly from the early warning systems approach. And we have, as a part of our MTSS process, built in decision rules um, and school-wide, district-wide expectations and progress monitoring points that kind of trigger um, when we know that we need to be more aware of small groups of students or, or individual students that may be in need of more support. And I will tell you, moving into next school year, uh, that continues to be a paramount concern, just essential for us because the social emotional well-being of everyone, uh, students, staff, families alike, um, have been placed under a lot of stress over this last year. And we're gonna start to see some of the behaviors that manifest from that stress really increase, we would predict, as more and more students return to our campus. So when we look at um, not just how we've been able to utilize our early warning supports this year, more importantly, I think it's led to some really uh, fruitful conversations about where we go from here, what does next year look like, and for us, there have been a number of changes that we started working through for this next school year as early as September. Um, we are reevaluating um, our staffing, um, how we are configuring our grade bands with teachers, how we are allocating um, responsibility to academic coaches, data coaches, and administrators within our district, some with a heavier focus on on-site learning and support, uh, and others with a, with a stronger focus on some of our virtual learning families. Um, it's been an interesting process, and I believe this has given us permission uh, to kind of think outside the box a little bit more freely without being questioned about how we're, we may be deviating from history and tradition, uh, whether that's within your school district or just public ed within the state or within the country. So for us, that, that is resulting in uh, the birth of a virtual learning academy with a more targeted tier one uh, system of supports in the areas of academics, uh, student engagement and attendance, um, student behavior and behaviors that impact learning. Um, it's also really caused us to focus more on our partnerships uh, within the community and what we are doing to um, extend learning opportunities beyond our school day. So we are working uh, with our local municipality um, and also some nonprofits with a faith-based uh, faith league here in the community to design before and after school programming for kids um, to really bolster our summer supports. Um, and we've also started working more closely with some for-profits in the area to really address some of the technology um, needs that exist within our community and to, to kind of bridge that digital divide. We're in a very, very um, high poverty area, so we're working with Cincinnati Bell Technologies to um, provide Wi-Fi access to everyone within the community, whether that's students or, or families that may not even have students within the district and also some other partnerships to provide technology to students and families that they will need, whether they're on-site learners or remote learners moving into the future. So um, very, very supportive of, of, of the work and the efforts. And I truly believe that anyone that embraces this path will, will probably experience similar benefits. Thanks, Bob. Thank you so much for sharing information about Lachlan Local School District. And I'm excited to present our next panelist from Toledo Public Schools, who will share a little bit about what's happening there. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, and as Bob said, thank you, Amy, too, for the fabulous introduction. Um, my name is Jennifer Lawless, and I'm the Senior Director of College and Career Readiness for Toledo Public Schools. Um, for those who do not know, Toledo Public is one of the large urban districts in the state. We're in Northwest Ohio. We have around 23,000, uh, approximately 23,000 students and 50 plus school buildings. Um, we began our journey with the early warning systems, or as we call it in Toledo, EWIMS, uh, back in 11-12 um, with one high school in particular um, through a school, call, or a school improvement grant. 
Um, we saw some great success uh, through the use of eWIMS. Um, however, as with time and initiatives, things come and go, as we know all the time in education. And so we stepped away um, from eWIMS and its use. Uh, and then we reignited uh, the use of eWIMS um, a few few years back when we began taking a very careful look at our graduation rates. So I would say that our catalyst for going back to eWIMS was really how do we improve our graduation rate and how do we better support our students so that we can get them across the finish line at the end. And um, so that reignited our journey with eWIMS. Um, and I would say that some of the things that we have learned um, through the use of eWIMS is that it's a good uh, process for getting all stakeholders on board. Um, it sounds kind of mushy, but I like to talk all the time about the power of eWIMS to get adults to care and listen and do root cause analysis on students and what's actually going on in their lives. Um, and so that's something that we've been able to, to spread across all of our secondary schools as we utilize eWIMS. Um, with regards to the pandemic, we have still been utilizing eWIMS, but I'll be honest, we've kind of had to pivot a bit, um, as I'm guessing most people have, um, especially we have been um, in a scenario at the secondary level where we were remote for a good portion of the year. We just came back in hybrid starting February 22nd. Um, and so we had to kind of pivot our work and how do we support our students in that virtual learning environment um, versus an in-person or hybrid model. So what we did though was take our lessons that we learned through use of the eWIMS model to build out um, a different support method for our students. And it really though is based upon the same model uh, that is eWIMS, right? That's identifying um, students that are at risk, assigning interventions or specific supports to those students and then monitoring their progress. Um, and so we have been doing that through something called a the student support teams at all of our secondary sites. Um, moving forward, as we start looking at what what does the future hold for us, especially with regards to eWIMS, we are slowly bringing eWIMS back on board, especially as we have students back in um, person with us learning. We know that we need to look at all three of our data points simultaneously. And I will say that eWIMS has led to a bigger investment in using data to drive decision-making at all of our secondary sites. Um, we do have all 11 of our secondary sites using eWIMS um, to some level, to some degree of implementation. Uh, we also um, will be continuing, obviously, I'd be remiss if I didn't honestly say that we'll have to do a little bit of rebooting um, when it comes to eWIMS implementation in the fall. But the good news is, is that we have such a strong foundation built with the eWIMS process and investment in the eWIMS process that I don't think restarting or rebooting will be that difficult or that challenging um, at all. So in Toledo, we have seen some real progress with regards to it adult engagement um, with the data and with the student stories, as I like to say, that come to light through eWIMS. Also, we have seen positive improvements in our graduation rate. Um, and that's something that I think is very telling due to a lot of different factors. It's not just eWIMS, but eWIMS is one, one of the key pieces. Um, and getting adults to the table to have those data-driven conversations about students and identifying them early um, for those who might be at risk, right? And trying to jump in and help and provide supports to those students. So that is eWIMS in Toledo Public Schools. Caitlin? Great, thank you so much, Jennifer, for sharing. Next up, we have Tim from North College Hill City School District. Welcome, Tim. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, yeah, again, my name is Tim Size. Uh, so, thank you, just as Bob and Jennifer said, uh, thank you, Amy, for the introduction and um, also for being so flexible. What, whereas the last two districts who presented have um, implemented early warning systems for, for multiple years, this was brand new to us last year. Um, we just began the work last year. Dr. Linda DeMarco, she was our district, uh, our SST 13 rep uh, through Hamilton County ESC. 
Um, Hamilton County ESC is a huge partner for us at North College Hill. Um, Linda brought this up to me, reached out to Amy. Amy was excited, jumped on to a, a video call with us and kind of walked me through it. And I began writing our early warning systems um, a little more than halfway through last year. So um, I'm going to focus more on what we're doing, what, what we have done this year and what we're doing moving forward with early warning systems. Um, whereas, um, well, first, integration. We, we have been utilizing early warning systems um, and leveraging those systems this year through our PBIS um, incentives uh, for course performance, behavior attendance, um, through our RTI process. Um, it's, it's worked flawlessly and really seamlessly has integrated with our NTSS process. Uh, we've worked hard the last three years um, on building our multi-tiered systems of support here in North College Hill. Um, and we've really ramped up efforts this year, uh, particularly due to the pandemic, um, with um, some extra oomph with uh, home visits. Um, we, we have been hybrid all year, but we brought our seniors back um, full day every day um, to kind of hammer a little extra hard with them because our early warning systems were um, showing that, that it was a, a huge need uh, for graduation purposes. Initial considerations moving on. Um, we all know research shows that the summer slide, um, though it impacts math most drastically, which is no surprise when you see our math scores uh, throughout our district, it's, it's the lowest scoring subject district-wide, but it, it, the summer slide does impact all content areas. Um, in addition, if, if COVID has taught us nothing else um, of value, um, it certainly has magnified and intensified uh, the need for social emotional learning and development with our scholars. So we're going to begin um, immediately. As soon as school ends, we're going to move into summer programming. Uh, our middle school, we will do in-person learning with the goal of rebuilding school family and creating positive relationships. Uh, we're going to do two four-week sessions. Uh, session one will be two groups, one enrichment and the other more summer school, traditional summer school. Um, and the summer school portion will be mandatory for those uh, with failing course performance. Our session two uh, will be all enrichment. And that session two will end two weeks before we begin the new year. So we're gonna we're, we're we've planned um, programming throughout the entire summer uh, for our middle school kids. Uh, again, that's I'm um, I neglected to say what I do with, for North College Hill. I'm the secondary campus principal, so I'm the principal for our middle school, which is grades five through eight, and our high school grades nine through twelve. Um, so parents and guardians will be able to choose. Uh, from three options, an eight to 10 option, a 10 to 12 option, or they can choose all the uh, combined eight to 12 uh, for that eight week uh, summer programming. And every other Friday during that programming, we will do a fun like family activity where we invite families to come in because that, that partnership with the community is so huge. Um, High school, it, our summer program will be a little different. It will run a five to six week summer school with two goals in mind, uh, credit recovery, clearly, um, and then an enrichment and tutoring second scoop uh, type of programming. Uh, we don't have this completely hashed out yet. Um, we're exploring um, some options with virtual and remote courses uh, for first credit. Uh, such as VHS or even staff teaching live, um, possibly even some in-person like PE course for credits. Um, and then we'd like to do a five-day jumpstart or bridge program that would be the week before uh, our scholars come back to school. Uh, so that'd be the week before we do team building activities, a lot of social emotional, and then kind of like a, a little boot camp, but, um, kind of reprogramming and teaching them how to be a scholar again. Um, just our crazy year was we about 30% of our kids have been um, fully remote. They chose virtual and then the rest have been in a hybrid program for, for the first three quarters of the year. They only came to school twice a week. 
Uh, so that, that clearly has, has put us behind in some regards. So um, The Power of Habit is a, uh, by Charles Duhigg is a, is a book I, I really like and enjoy. In that book, it says, uh, good leaders seize crises to make organiza uh, remake organizational habits. In fact, crises are such valuable opportunities that a wise leader often prolongs a sense of emergency on purpose. So what we're doing is we're, we're um, we've restart, we're going to do a restart redesign. Uh, my superintendent and the assistant superintendent are um, two of the most supportive uh, bosses I've ever had. Um, they kind of gave me free reign and let me redesign. I, I redesigned the, the district calendar, um, our grading system, our um, mode of delivery where we're going to let me move let me back up a minute a survey of our teachers uh this year showed um in their opinion in their professional opinion 88 percent of our course failures are attributed to not doing or not learning on remote days um, that's for our hybrid kids um, so our restart redesign will um, this will be addressed through increased instructional times we're going to go from seven bells to six uh, which will also increase their seat time in each of the courses. We're gonna bolster tier one and enhance our tiers two and three. Uh, we're gonna to switch to a modified trimester schedule. Um, there'll be increased opportunities for course and credits, increased opportunities for me remediation, enrichment and second scoop courses. Uh, we're gonna streamline, solidify our curriculum flow and our SPEG continuum uh, and really uh, hammer out our decision rules uh, because of this new system we really uh need to make sure we get correct placement for all the all the courses um benefits of this increased passage rates uh we're going from seven to six bells that's less um courses a student will have to take if if we're struggling with failures why do we make them take seven courses when they could take six and focus on those better uh, so they'll be able to focus on fewer classes at a time increase support in all tiers and across all spheres um, those who fail the first two trimesters will, uh, in core classes, can recover credit in the short third trimester. We're doing a modified trimester, so the first two trimesters are longer with a short third. Um, we're hoping this decreases teacher burnout, uh, less less um, bells for them to teach, more plan time within the, uh, which to work, because um, the social emotional piece of this pandemic hasn't just affected our students, it's affected our teachers as well. Um, there, there are a lot of more, um, a lot more benefits and how we're doing it. Uh, information. I'm out of time because I see Caitlin back on the screen. So, um, some additional um, considerations, though, uh, that directly relate to um, early warning systems are diagnostics. Um, you utilizing current researching more our restart readiness assessments through the state of Ohio universal screeners, TFI, all the stuff that, that um, early warning systems help us identify, um, those will be huge in our additional considerations in, in identifying academic needs and social emotional needs. So thank you. I, I'll, I'll stop talking now. Thanks, Tim. You'll have some more time during the panel discussion to share more. We appreciate you giving insight on what's happening in your district. And I'm going to hand it over to our final panelist today. Pete is going to share about the Western Local School District. Oh, Pete, I think you're muted. All right. Uh, thanks again. I apologize for that. Um, obviously, last March caught us by surprise. We were not prepared, as many of you, for what hit us. Western is very rural, isolated. Um, we try to provide wraparound services for our community because they cannot um, reach those resources themselves. We partnered with Southern Ohio Medical Center, and we now have a clinic 
uh, that's part of our school. We used one of our old classrooms and converted it to a medical clinic so that our students and community can get the uh, support it needs there. Uh, our community is widespread. Uh, transportation is an issue. Um, even though we're a small district with just over 700 students, we have 13 buses and every bus travels over two hours um, in the morning and two hours in the evening to, to transport kids home. Uh, so kids are on the bus a long time. We're high poverty, uh, over 90% free and reduced. There's no connectivity in most places. Um, we've got a, an Amish Mennonite community in there. So not only is there not Wi-Fi or internet, um, there's no cell phone service in most places and some of our families don't even have electricity. So March hit us hard in the end of last year. Uh, virtual and remote learning is not an option for us, uh, especially when you take into account the social emotional cost to our students. Many of them come from families and homes that lack structure and support. So we've been fortunate this year that we've been able to attend in person every day all year long with, with very minimal um, cases. Uh, we've had four staff members this year, um, but it was isolated and contained in only two student um, events. Uh, and again, with very limited contact. So we've been in person every day, all year long. And that's been important for our district. Knowing the academic and social impact, we had to focus first on attendance. As you look at the early warning system, we had to get our kids in school. We offered um, the blended and the hybrid options for those families, but we were honest about the research and about the, the data for our community. And so we, we let them know student learning is much better when it's done in person from a qualified staff member who can assess and monitor student learning on a daily basis. And so our, our targeted message was now more than ever, Students need to be in school, they need to be learning, and we just kept using that phrase now more than ever. And, and we're gonna to continue to use that as we begin next year, and we try to make up for lost learning. We had a community meeting where we addressed this. We made a video advertisement that, that stressed the importance of being in school. Um, so that was the first indicator of that early warning system that we really focused on as a result of this pandemic. We sent out attendance postcards, we had pep rallies and incentives. Um, and then probably mid-year, we started to take a look at all the other factors. Going through the on-time graduation project with, with Amy, um, one of the tools we became familiar with was the risk calculator. We took that template, created our own spreadsheet, um, and it has, student demographics like IEP, mobility, family supports. It has student discipline as factors, um, classroom grades, standardized test scores, extracurricular participation if they're involved in after school learning programs, parent engagement, social emotional components. We gave them a life skill score. Uh, we took into account their ACE, ACEs survey. Um, attendance, hobbies, and interests. There's nearly 40 data points for each student. Um, some of those factors add risk points, and some of those factors reduce risk points, depending on it, whether it's positive or negative. And so each student there in that risk score has a, a final score, and we can sort that by that number. Um, the highest scores we address first, and some directly, we had to bring in some intervention counseling services, and some just through TBT discussions, mentorship programs that we could do in-house. But, but that risk calculator, uh, after we got past the attendance issue and could focus on some other things, that risk calculator really helped us identify what our issues were and who those students were that we needed to target. As we look towards summer and fall, uh, a couple things we want to do. We want to celebrate um, that we've been in school, uh, the hard work that teachers and students have put in. Um, so, so that's got to be a, a, a turning point that, yeah, we appreciate the extra effort it's taken um, to get where we're at and there's still work to do. We've got a three-tiered plan um, 
that we are looking forward as we, we move forward. Tier one um, is, is not gonna be that effective for most of our families, but for some of our families, we wanna make it available. Uh, and for when they're here, it is a an online um, parent and student library for academic resources and an online parent and student library for SEL resources. We know most of our families do not have connectivity, but those supports will be here on in the school so that a student, maybe they're in fifth grade and they're learning fractions, but they need a remedial lesson. They'll be able to search fractions and all of our teachers are building this complete database of, of lessons. Um, some they teach themselves and video themselves. Some they borrow from like a, a, an academy that's online. Uh, but, the, but a student could type in fractions and find lessons, not just from fifth grade or sixth grade, but they could go back to a fourth grade or third grade introduction to fractions. Uh, all those resources will be searchable, uh, put on there by the teachers. Uh, in this database. And, and it also so it will include SEL resources. We partner uh, with a program called School Connect, and it has a lot of self-awareness, self-regulation, uh, social awareness. It addresses a lot of those social emotional needs, emotional issues, anger control. Uh, so we're gonna have those resources available as well online. But again, that's not gonna hit most of our kids when they're not here. Um, so tier two is gonna be a summer connections, uh, one through our reaching out to them. We have an app called Kimbo, where we, we can reach out and connect with parents and students. Um, we're gonna have a five week camp um, in July and August. Uh, we'll provide transportation because they won't get here. We provide meals. Uh, and then there's gonna be academic and SEL sessions for each of those summer schools. And then the final tier, is uh, we're calling it essentials bridging. For every grade level, we are identifying those essential skills that students need in order to be successful in that grade level in that class. Those essential skills then, we're gonna provide a bridging for students to take. And as soon as they master those essential skills, they can move into uh, the regular classroom and don't need that extra tutoring, that extra bridging class. But it's gonna um, be based on student diagnostics, their skills. And the, go the goal is to uh, bridge them to be on track. And we'll use a lot of that, that information from our risk calculator to identify those students. It, it's a three-year plan. We're gonna use CARES funding to help support and, and add some additional intervention staff to help get this going. Um, our teachers are gonna be working after school to help develop the plans to identify students, to look at the data. And we're using some of the carryover funds from last year where, where things were shut down early uh, to work on those things after school uh, using PD stipends for those teachers to work on that. So a lot of things going on, but we're excited about where, where we're headed. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Pete. And we are now going to move to the panel discussion. And I will ask all of our panelists if they would like you to come back on camera. And the audience has been asking some questions throughout, so I'm gonna ask and we'll get through as many as we can. And I will start with a question, and whoever wants to jump in first can. To what extent are you thinking of approaching the next school year with different assumptions about who needs support? So for example, if all students have an increased level of risk and need some support, what are you thinking about in terms of approaching the next school year? I'll jump in first, Caitlin. I, I will tell you from our perspective in Lachlan, our assumption is that all of our students are in need of additional support. Um, we've been a district with students on site all year, but the impacts of the disruptions have been very real for everyone's boys and girls, and, and we know that. Uh, we're looking at some different models that will maybe be more flexible and cater uh, more specifically to family needs, but also more importantly, I think um, the interests and the desires of our students in a way that we've not uh, embraced in the past. We're, we're, we're going to add a, a vocational lab setting on our campus, uh, specifically focused on middle school kids, grades 7, 8, 9. Historically, that's always been a 10 through 12 conversation in our school district, but we're starting to realize now that that's, that's probably too late. Um, the build out of a more robust uh, K-12 virtual learning academy experience 
that we believe will not only support families that are interested in those options, but can also support our on-site learners outside of the confines of the school day. So that's another opportunity for us to, to hopefully get in front of kids, engage with families, and support them as we work through a lot of the challenges that I know we all face. I would say the last one, I know this is really specific to secondary, but I can't emphasize enough. Uh, we're now seeing more clearly than ever the need for us to continue to build out our K-3 literacy model within our district because the conversations that we're having around literacy up through our middle school and high school um, are alarming. And, and I think that a lot of folks can probably relate to that. And it's very much so a high school initiative in our district and that it's going to help to bridge some divides that we're experiencing as a district with students. Now those are, you know, the, the end result will be down the road a bit, but it's definitely a focal point for us. So I would jump in and say um, that we obviously know that we're going to have a large amount of struggling students, but because of our sheer size, we have to start somewhere. Um, and so we will utilize, as we have in the past, our early warning systems data points to at the secondary level. Um, we're working on transitioning that down to elementary as well, but at the secondary level, we'll use those data points as our jumping off. Um, for addressing our students need and that are in need. We are looking at Western. We're taking the rest of this year to, uh, again, identify those essential skills that we think students are lacking uh, because of the lost learning and create um, those data points for students. We're, we're going to spend this year finding out where students are. And then uh, that bridging concept going into next year that's not just K-1 bridging. We're gonna have bridging at every grade level uh, that builds in the, those essential skills. And it's just supposed to be short-term. As soon as a student meets those standards, those skills that are necessary, then then they don't have to go to that bridging class anymore. Uh, but those are the, that we're gonna spend this year identifying those students. And we had another question. So thinking about, you know, those are some great ways to think about identifying students with risk. There were a couple of questions that came in in terms of supports provided to students. So you've identified students at risk. What supports are you providing? So a question came in if anybody knows of any sort of national repository that includes strategies or programs that may help move students towards graduation on time um, or close to on time. So I can start with that and then if people want to jump in, I think in many ways that is the um, the, the golden unicorn. Um, so traditionally part of the challenge in secondary schools is we, we have a dearth of research around different interventions. Um, I do know in terms of on the social emotional learning side, um, the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning, CASEL, they released um, a secondary school kind of what works clearinghouse um, inventory of different um, SEL programs um, that's geared at secondary schools. As you start to look through that, you'll find in terms of high school, there's just not a lot that have a, a, a really robust research base around them. Um, so that's one place that you can go in terms of looking at um, SEL programs. Um, there are a few, um, uh, there was a recent um, dropout prevention practice guide that IES put out that has different strategies and they are continuing to add um, to the What Works Clearinghouse research that's been done on different interventions um, focused on different topical areas and you can search it by different um, kind of outcomes of interest or areas of interest. Um, that's another place and that's um, there's some um, interventions on there but again we we really on the kind of evidence base um, that's something that we don't have a lot of, and we're not going to have a lot of that by the time we get to the fall and as we're planning now. And so one of the things um, in my conversations that I encourage people to think about are not kind of capital I interventions, but also think about kind of uh, strategies and things that we know are in multiple programs that have a research base around it and implementing those strategies um, rather than thinking about kind of that packaged um, kind of intervention. And, and I will add to that, um, Cassell, and there are some others that have like implementation strategies on how are you, as Jeannie said, implementing 
um, different strategies based off your data, how are you making database decisions, how you're aligning that. So it's really setting up the environment and then talking through what are some of those structures that need to be in place as opposed to here is a program because we all know that one program is not going to meet everyone's needs. So really understanding those environmental structures and of course PBIS has a lot of that classroom and environmental structures and supports that can also help as people are trying to develop their own systems. So just to Jenny's point, um, the, those IES practice guides in the What Work Clearinghouse, if, if that's not a resource that you're familiar with, I would definitely make a note of that, ies.ed.gov. When we developed our local literacy plan, K-12, that was our starting point. When we looked at algebra intervention in our high school and middle school, that was our starting point. When we looked at PBIS structures, K-12, through that was our starting point. If you look at the way that those documents are organized, they're very easy to navigate and it, it's a good starting point and it takes you away from the conversation of programs like Mona said and that's something that we were very guilty of here in our district is that we were looking for the next program when we should be looking for evidence-based strategies and then resources that are aligned to those so um, it's definitely worth your time to check those out if you haven't already thank you we also have another question asking if any of you all work with students who may be in an alternate setting, so any sort of treatment program, maybe a correctional site? Um, and if so, do you apply similar strategies to data collection or, or data analysis, thinking about working towards on-time graduation with that population of students? I can take that one. <laughs> uh, as a state support team consultant, I've worked in juvenile detention centers and separate facilities, and you're absolutely right. We should take that same approach, and we should be anchoring with the home school districts because those students are still connected to school districts, so you will be using the same approach to how are we looking at credit recovery? How are we looking at meeting the needs of students, particularly who are on IEPs who may not have had those IEPs implemented with Fidelity in a while and then how are we going to recoup those credit hours in this not only in this separate facility but the plan to reintegrate them back into their home schools so um, yes you do apply a lot of the same systems they look a little differently but you definitely apply some of the same work there great and speaking of the role of the state or the region or the district, can we hear a little bit about what the role of those entities have been in support of what's happening at the local district or the, the local um, centers? Sure, I can jump in with that. Um, we mentioned the on-time graduation project, and that was something that I was very fortunate to be able to organize through the Ohio Department of Education. and. I think one of the, the great ways, and, and everyone can say yes or no to this, um, but I think one of the things that, that I was able to do because of the work I was doing at the state level was to see how all of the initiatives and requirements that the school districts have on them in our state can be integrated so that when we talk about an early warning system, we're not making it one more thing. We're looking at how it, it a meets the research and does you know it, what it's intended to do to identify our students but then also supports the, the current processes and, and um, structures that they have in place and are required to meet for our school district so i think that was one of the really great things that i was able to do as a state level representative is help them see the the connections and and make those uh dots kind of all line up I would agree with that, Amy. So yes, that is the answer. And I also think you also brought in additional resources like dropout recovery, um, different ways of how do you take your data and analyze it. So I think some of the materials and trainings were very helpful in helping people to look at their data, maybe in different ways that they didn't look at it before. So I think having those meetings with you all regularly, holding us accountable to those data and collecting them and having those conversations have, um, I can say definitely for Lachlan, has helped to make that something that they do more regularly. It may not be all in the same way we've done them with you, but it's definitely a piece of their permanent data analysis and how are we triangulating that data. Mm -hmm. And I just Thanks. piggyback on what both um, Dr. Mona and Amy were saying. That the the whole reason our district got into uh, early warning systems, or utilizing early warning system, was because our SST rep, uh, Dr. DeMarco, um, had, had brought that up to me, and then she hooked us up with Amy, and Amy was happy to get on and do whatever we need, to, uh, provide the training. I, I would... Um, 
when it comes to the, the original question, I, I would reach out to your local SST or your local ESC. Uh, we're, we're in um, Southwest Ohio, so our, um, and we're in Hamilton County, so Hamilton County ESC is our local and they are um, just huge, huge, huge partners. Uh, I, I don't know how we would do the work without them. They, uh, um, e even the reps that, that work with us, um, it, it was Dr. DeMarco for a long time and we've got a couple uh, new reps now. They're just, they're just a part of our district. They're a part of our family, even though they are from our local ESC. Um, it, you develop the right relationships with them. It just works seamlessly. It's not like you're working with an outside entity. Um, but yeah, we, we wouldn't be involved in this work without them. Um, I would add real quick from a district perspective. So yeah, we too began our journey by working with the state support team and that was extremely valuable. But from a district perspective, um, I think it's imperative, especially if you're from a district that, well, I would think any district, but in, in Toledo, because we have multiple buildings and have to do the same support for all the buildings, having that district level buy-in is imperative. Um, and I would say that one of the things that have has made this work so successful in Toledo has been that district buy-in, um, even if it's from a financial lens, right? So helping uh, compensate by getting substitutes for team meetings, for instance, would be one example. Um, investing in the human capital, allowing me to have the time to work with the school-based teams, um, and allowing us to connect that work and thinking outside the box. I know Bob mentioned that, right? So allowing us to think outside the box when it comes to helping our students at the secondary level has been imperative um, from the district level. I, we would not be this far also with, with the supports and interventions that we provide to our students. We need co uh, cohesiveness at the district level from that, that lens as well. So I, I think SST is super important, but also so is that internal buy-in. Great. And I'm gonna turn it over now um, to Jenny. We appreciate all of your questions that you've asked and thank you again to the panelists for sharing information about your districts and then being willing to engage in a dialogue with us here. I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny now. She's gonna go over a few resources for our audiences and then I will wrap this up. Great, thanks Caitlin. So on this slide, and you guys will receive copies of the slides so you can access these links even easier. We wanted to include a slide that had some information about Ohio's um, statewide longitudinal data system grant project of which is including um, their early warning indicator systems. Um, so there's information here. And if you've got specific questions about that, I would encourage you to reach out to Amy as well. And she can help make sure that if she can't answer it, she'll, she'll help put you in connection with the right person. And then the next slide just has some additional links um, to other um, resources. So in 2016, which feels like a lifetime ago, um, IES through the regional education laboratories um, did a, a series of resources that were related to early warning systems. Those are all on that landing page. Um, at AIR, we have um, a website specifically around our work in early warning systems that has implementation guides and other free resources. Uh, and then we specifically called out our updated 2020 uh, implementation guide as the final point on this slide. So with that, I wanna thank our panelists and I'll hand it back to Caitlin. Thanks, Jenny. So I just wanted to take this opportunity again to thank our panelists, thank our audience members. Um, this was a collaboration between the National Center on Intensive Intervention and the Center on PBIS. These are two federally funded technical assistance centers. And we just want to let you know that um, this webinar does not reflect any views of anybody at the Office of Education, nor is it an endorsement of any specific program um, that we've presented today. If you have questions or are interested in learning more about students with intensive intervention needs, so thinking past the data collection and also in addition to providing those supports for those students, please feel free to check out our website. Um, and again, we are providing one more webinar in this series focused on students with intensive um, behavior needs. Um, and the registration for that is now available and it will be on April 30th. So thank you all for your attendance. Um, we enjoyed our time with you today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.